and we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Translators on Air. My name is Dmitry Kornyukhov. I'm your host. Join me tonight, my incredible co-host, Elena Tereshenkova. Hi, Elena. Hey, everyone. And our guest, Alina Simkan. Hi, Alina. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your invitation. Alina is a translator with uh, more than 10 years of experience. Uh, she's a member of a Chartered Institute of Linguists and exam moderator at the Institute for Translation and Interpreting in the UK. Uh, Alina also manages uh, a translation company called Inbox Translations Limited uh, from London in the UK. <laughs> yes. And she also speaks at industry events where she shares her knowledge and promoting best practices. So the topic of our conversation will be working with the translation agencies. And I think Alina has a ton of experience of working with freelance translators and he, she could uh, really uh, share some very useful tips for all the freelance translators out there and which hopefully will make uh, working with translation agency a little bit more fun and enjoyable for all of us, in both including managers of the agencies and us mm -hmm. freelance translators. Uh, we have quite a few new faces here. Uh, for, for those of you who are watching this kind of recording for the first time ever, uh, this is happening live. This is a live webinar. Uh, if you have a question and if you want Alina, Helena, and me to discuss a particular question or a topic, there is an orange button below this video that says uh, ask a question or suggest a topic. Feel free to share your questions there. There is also a chat window on the right hand side. You can say hi in this chat window, tell everyone where you're from and uh, what kind of texts you're working on uh, and have fun. Uh, also, very important message. Uh, the second season of Translators on Air has been sponsored uh, by our friends at Smercat. Uh, Smercat develops translation technology for translators and they offer it absolutely for free. So if you're getting free cat tool, check out their website by clicking a green button below this video. Or if you're watching this or listening to this in the recording on YouTube or SoundCloud or iTunes, uh, just check out the first link in the description of this video. Uh, we have a lot of people actually join us. Uh, hi, Aureli, Natalie, Margot, Federica, Tracy, Clara, Sophia, Christina, Dimitro, Daniela, Nancy, Liber, Mary Claire, Stefan, Julia, Andre, Fozan, Nicholas, Andre, <laughs> Tina, Eliza, Daniela, Jean. Thank you so much, guys, for <laughs> watching us today. Uh, I'm sorry if I butchered some of your names. Uh, I didn't mean to do it. Uh, I hope you enjoy this webinar. And Alina, how are you? Good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, are, you, are you excited about this webinar? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as, as as we all are, uh, yeah. it's it, it's always fun to talk to people who kind of like on the other side of the barricade, so to speak, people who know uh, something about <laughs> both worlds, the world of translation management and managing your own company and the world of freelance translators, and you kind of look on the intersection of those two worlds. Uh, can you please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your experience and how you ended up working at, with this company, how you um, right, so, well, first of all, it started with my love for languages, obviously, um, and uh, English was the first language I started studying when I was seven, uh, and French came later, but English is still my first love, um, and I studied uh, languages at university, English and French language and literature, and it was then, I think it was um, probably the, during my last year at uni when I did some work experience, um, which involved, among other things, translating and some interpreting as well, some liaison interpreting. Um, and I loved it. So um, after graduating, I did a master's degree in intercultural cooperation um, in, in the contemporary business environment, also involving languages, obviously, English and French again. Um, I worked um, as a full-time teacher for well, until, until 2012, while also working part-time as a translator and interpreter, as, and that happened both in Romania, where I come from, and in the UK. Um, but in the end, um, I had to decide because it, it was a bit overwhelming to do both. 
so I had to decide which one um, to take on full time. So I decided on um, on translations, um, and this happened mainly because my partner was doing a master's degree, and uh, for one of his modules, um, he had to discuss a business model, and he had chosen um, a translation agency, which was a virtual thing at that time. Um, so when I decided to to take the plunge and just go and stop teaching and go full-time for translations because we already had this project which was as I said on paper virtual um, we decided to well why not we had a business plan well what we had on paper and what actually happens in real life are not exactly the same thing uh, <laughs> yeah. but that still helped because we had a sort of plan so mm -hmm. yeah that's how um, we, uh, i ended up uh, running inbox translation that's a very interesting story and you also work with your part together with your partner yes mm. that's that's <laughs> that makes it even more interesting <laughs> i know yeah <laughs> so how long you've been uh, uh running this agency uh we uh, we registered um, as a company in 2013, so it's almost four years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what what are so the main? Pardon? What are the main What are the main obstacles when you you were just starting out with this agency? Mm. Any, well, any challenges you had to overcome? I can't think of any major ones, to be honest. Um, but that be that mainly because as i said we had a sort of plan we had a plan beforehand so um we didn't have any major obstacles but obviously um there are things you cannot anticipate for example uh, budget is one thing because well you might have an idea of what sort of budget you need for certain things but they might not in reality they might not be exactly the same so that would be one thing um, another one was finding the right people for the project once we started getting more business in um, and that is because people don't know you when you when you are just starting out as an agency and I understand that some translators were a bit reluctant maybe to work with us because we had I don't know they we had no online presence or, or at least we didn't have any I don't know uh, blue board rating or or anything like that so they didn't have any information about who we, who we are and and all that so that was one little obstacle not it wasn't a major one but it was let's say one of them um, and obviously the main the main not obstacle let's say but the main challenge, challenge yes the main challenge and I think um, this applies to any new business, be it an agency, be it a freelance translator, is getting clients. Mm. So that is the main the main challenge for all of us. So it was more difficult than finding the right translators for the project. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> so let's get down to our, the topic of our conversation, which is uh, working uh, with translation agencies so and uh, the first question would be why do agencies look for in translators well um, I think well some of the some of these questions might and answers obviously um, will apply not only when working with translation agencies but with clients in general um, mm. and now if we and clients let's say um, might not know exactly what translation entails so they might not have the same expectations um, as an, a translation agency um, well so some of the things we're looking for first of all obviously we need people who are qualified so not just not just anyone who's bilingual we all know that we know what some people say oh you speak two languages fine you can be a translator or you can earn some you can do that as a hobby you know your free time mm. or, or or people don't understand when you're a freelancer you can make my, some money my mom on didn't the side. understand pardon you can make some money on the side exactly exactly <laughs> so um 
So we, we need people who are qualified translators. And by that, obviously, I mean um, who have ideally who have translation studies um, or who have experience as a translator, not just, um, I mean, you can obviously be a translator without having studied translation because a lot of people may come from um, other fields like engineering, let's say. And that is actually one of the fields where it's more important for them to have an engineering background rather than theory, theoretical translation studies. Mm -hmm. So obviously each case is different. It will depend on the type of project. It will depend on the language combination. Um, we know there are countries, for example, in Romania including, where uh, translators are expected to work from and into their mother tongue. So they would translate um, into their uh, other language, not only into their mother tongue, which, for example, we, we know that um, is not the best practice. I mean, at, in the UK, at least in, at our agency, we do expect people to translate into their mother tongue. Um, there might be situations, we haven't come across them, uh, like if there is a very rare language combination where we cannot find, uh, let's say, I don't know, Tui or Lingala, where it would be difficult to find a native English speaker to translate from that language, might, uh, oh, actually we did have, oh, I, we did have a project where, I can't remember the language, but it wasn't a very usual language. And we worked with, uh, uh, with a translator who was native in the source, but then we had uh, we had that proofread and where I mean the translator and the proofread the proofreader was native English and they worked together, uh, so the proofreader worked with the translator to produce the final version. So as I said, each project will be different, but we do expect people to work with people who are qualified, who take their work seriously, who don't just do it as a as a hobby or as so that would be the main thing. Um, there are obviously other things such as, um, like they may, they may seem very unimportant or really small details, um, like how responsive someone is. I mean, for me, to be honest, is one of the most important aspects when working with someone. Um, and I know it, it might come as, I was actually surprised um, during one, a presentation I held for the Chartered Institute of Linguists. Um, I asked the audience, so how quickly do you reply to an email? And, I, and by email, I, I mean um, an email from, yeah, from, from a potential client about a potential mm -hmm. project. Um, the first answer I got was um, as soon as I can or as soon as possible, as soon as I can or something like that. I said, well, that's quite relative. And then I asked them to elaborate, and someone said, "On the same day, if possible." Mm -hmm. And I thought, I thought that would be, I, I mean, if I send an inquiry, let's say, at ten in the morning, and then the person takes five hours to reply, and they reply saying, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not available," because that mm -hmm. can happen, means I have wasted five hours, and I haven't managed to find someone for the project and I will have to start the same thing all over again. Um, obviously I'm not talking about, I know there is this practice among some agencies to send mass emails, um, dear vendor, dear translator, I hate that and I never do it. Um, mm. And then obviously give the job to the first person who replies. Fair mm -hmm. enough, If when I got that as, as a translator, I didn't even bother replying to be honest and I understand this. But when someone sends you a personal inquiry and so when it's clear they want to work with you and they send it to you personally and then I think it's it's good practice to reply let's say within an hour that would be reasonable to expect I mean if it's something very urgent we I would pick up the phone and mm. um, and ask the person um, but other than that, I think it's important to be um, to be responsive. That's one of the. What about what about um, some inquiries? Okay, do you send inquiries on weekends? Because weekends is actually the only exception that I make. I try to respond within an hour. I always have my 
phone with me and I've got mail in it. So even if I'm somewhere running errands or stuff like that, I can still check my email and answer within an hour. Uh, weekends tend to be the only time. Yes, that, that's an exception for say. me. So if I get, if I get uh, an inquiry saying that it's urgent, then I will probably reply to it. But if not, I will probably let it sit there uh, till Monday. Yeah, I agree. No, uh, if it's mm. an inquiry sent, I don't know, um, late in the evening, because that's when the client sent their, their project, <laughs> or during the weekend. We do have um, the other project during the weekend when we work with clients for whom uh, Saturdays and Sundays are working days. Uh, like um, in the um, in the United Arab Emirates, for example, uh, mm -hmm. but generally we don't. I mean, I wouldn't expect someone to reply immediately to those emails sent during the weekend. And for those projects, because for that particular client, I have um, a team of translators who always work for the for this client. So, uh, and they know, and I know I can rely on them. So it's. I send them the inquiry and I know I can rely on them to reply and to uh, to work on that. So, yeah, weekends would be an exception. Daniela asks, what about time difference? That's a great question too. Very good question. Um, I mean, agencies in general should be aware of the of where the, the translators they work with are based. So, obviously, mm -hmm. um, if I have a request for, uh, I don't know, um, Latin American Spanish um, and I know that person is based in Argentina or for example um, I would take that into consideration and I cannot expect if if my inquiry is sent <laughs> during the night I cannot expect for them to uh, to reply immediately so no yes I mean the client be the agency or direct client should be aware of the time difference and not expect an answer immediately if that's the case hmm. yeah if i if uh, i have an urgent project i would probably choose someone local who i can contact uh, I, I have a question uh, so let's let's say you are reaching out to a potential translator who uh, you want to place on a particular project and how often do this doesn't happen then a, a translator uh, simply replies that he or she is not available and just does nothing to help you out. Does it happen very often? Like, oh, I'm mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not available. Sorry, and then nothing else. Other options like referring to a colleague or uh, offering to. I think it de it depends. It depends on the relationship I have with these people, with these translators. Um, if there are people that I've worked with before that um, I know very well uh, they usually refer someone else um, mm -hmm. but if it's someone I've contacted for the first time and they're not available they usually say oh I'm sorry I cannot take this one I'm not available this is what I've got until now so yeah they I do get the I do get referrals uh, but only if uh, I have worked with these translators before so only from uh, trusted people with who you worked before. Yes, that's interesting because uh, I sometimes, uh, uh, occasionally, I have to outsource work uh, when it gets too much for me. Uh, I've done this in the past, and uh, I've noticed that a lot of times people people just uh, say they're not available and they just don't offer anything in return. I mean, I spend my time as a potential client. I really reached out to them uh, and um, I'm, I'm expecting for a reply for a solution for my problem and like you said I'm wasting my time waiting for a reply and the reply is just nothing um, <laughs> so I, don't I think know. It's, 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 very, it's a very strange behavior for, from some freelancers I'm not saying that all, all the translators are doing this but I, I noticed that quite often translators I just, think that's... are not focused on a solution of a problem that might be because uh, both you and I are translators and are, are and work within the industry. So they probably expect us to already know other people. That's why they don't refer. I, I, I don't know. I'm just saying, I mean, I'm just wondering whether, I'm not sure, 
whether uh, that would be the case with direct clients. I'm not sure whether they would, they are more likely to refer a colleague to a direct client than they would be to refer the same colleague to an agency or another colleague like you. So I, I don't know. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, uh, we have a few other questions. Oh, about, speaking about approaching agencies, you know, so this is where a lot of freelancers get confused and have make a ton of mistakes. And it's often very scary part of running your business when you're approaching a potential agency client. So what are the best ways to approach an agency you want to work with? Um, first of all, show them that it's them you want to work with and you're not sending a mass email to all the agencies on, on a certain <laughs> list you have. Um, I get so many emails with dear sir, <laughs> like, or dear sir slash madam, dear vendor manage, manager, dear HR manager, dear whatever. I'm sorry, but those will be ignored because we get so many of them that first, we I wouldn't have the time to go through all of them. And secondly, because they don't, um, they don't tell me anything. I mean, they are just like it, all the other hundreds I receive. So being personal and showing um, it's that particular agency you want to work with and not just anyone who happens to reply uh, is the first, that would be the, the main thing. I mean, uh, I think I did um, some statistics at some point and I think less than 4% of the emails we receive are personal um, and each and every one of these emails gets a reply so that would be the first thing and obviously um, the email you send needs to be uh, free of spelling mistakes make sure you get the um, person's name right and I should know better here um, I did a well I sent instead of sending um, dear Bobby because I mean, Bobby's. If it if it's a really common name, I don't. I, well, I I do now, but I didn't check. Um, I did <laughs> double check the spelling because it's quite easy, right? Well, I managed to write dear Bobby, so yeah, uh, that was a bit embarrassing. Um, so yeah, make sure you get the person's name right and double check the spelling. Um, but not only the name, but make sure you, the email in general is um, free of spelling mistakes or grammar mistakes. Because obviously, as linguists, we are expected to uh, to write properly. Um, so uh, be be personal. What else? So be personal. Make sure you you have a, a, a you have a good um, cover email. So as I said, free of spelling mistakes. Um, Mm, I think it's good. Mm, I think that it's best if you get if you know that person of that agency beforehand. I know a few things about them. For example, social media is great. I mean, um, once you you know a bit more about them, obviously that helps you. That will help you um, get to know them better. So you can obviously be more personal. They will know probably who you are already when when you get in touch. Um, and um, what else? I think I forgot my idea. Um, yeah. ah, you would also um, find out what sort of projects they work on. For example, if it's a, an agency specializing um, in medical translations and you do uh, literary translations, you will not be a good match. So there will be no point in sending uh, a CV, cover letter, brochure, or whatever. Obviously, you can still get in touch, just, you know, you never know for referrals like we talked earlier. Um, so make sure you're a good match and be personal. And make sure you have the right skills. I mean, you may have a very well-written cover email and be personal, but if you're not a qualified, experienced translator that they may be looking for, then Now also some agencies. I can see I can see sorry I yeah. can see uh, Nicolas made a good point sometimes we don't know if it's a he or a she um I would I would say yeah there are agencies where it might be a bit difficult to know who 
who you are talking to. Um, so in this case, well, still, dear sir, I still don't like dear sir, madam. I would rather get a general hello, maybe, and maybe a few things about the agency. If you can't um, address a person directly because you don't know who that person is, you might uh, just talk a bit about the agency. Uh, would it be okay to phone to know? Yes, yeah. You, you can you can um, you can phone the agency beforehand and ask who to speak to or who to send it to or yeah that that should be fine. When I can find out who I'm referring to, I usually try to I write dear team or dear inbox translate mm -hmm. team. And then I also mentioned some facts about the agency so that the person who gets the email knows that I want to work with them. That, um, that can also work if you can't find, I mean, in the case of our agency, for example, it's that easy. Yes. On the website. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> but yes. Okay. Easy, but, but yeah, agency with, with certain agencies, yeah, that would be a very good approach. Or like Tracy mm. suggests, uh, you can um, call them and find out who, the, I mean, if it's a bigger agency where there will be one or two people who um, deal with applications, you can, mm. You can ask who that person is so you know who, who to address, yeah. And another thing to do is, I think, just to check the agency's website because some agencies write uh, on their website what kind of information they want to get. I exactly. mean, rates, working, mm -hmm. uh, uh, your language pairs, your specializations. Yeah. Uh, some agencies have a list of what they want to get in the cover letter, and I think it's it's just logical to send them that information. And then we, I just don't have to uh, think what I should write in that cover letter, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do your research is always... Um you, it's always a good uh, a good idea. Mm, exactly. And uh, for example, uh, you can also, um, apart from the website, you can look on LinkedIn and see who works at that company. Mm. That's yeah. another way to. So it all all it takes is a bit of research, really. Yeah, but so, sometimes people simply prefer selling mass <laughs> emails, <laughs> which obviously end up in a spam box in many many occasions so yeah, yeah. Pro proper research is a must how do you how do you normally process uh, a right kind of email do you reply to that person do you add them to some sort of a database uh which which sort of emails um if they are general mass when, emails no they no, they, when, they, well, they no, no. when someone they is reaching out and they they, they they seem nice they want to work with your company they did their research they address you by name Made and they have all the right qualifications and, and they, all, all that. Yeah. All, all the right, all the right things. Yeah. How do you, yeah. how do you proceed from that? First, they, they always get um, a reply from me. They that that's for for sure. Um, well, depending on whether we, you know, we might have uh, projects for that language combination, we can advise further. And um, until I think I, I can't remember when we stopped that but um until recently or not that recent um we had an application form on our website simply because it's easier to process all the applications and have everything in one place um and have all the information the same sort of information we are looking for from everyone applying uh, but we stopped doing that because we had loads of applications and we do have a lot of people on our database um, and we might not have enough projects for everyone. So we stopped recruiting this way. However, um, when we still might have a project for, for which we don't have um, the right people on the database, but we do have, um, as I said, with social media and the conferences and events I go to, um, I've been in touch with a lot, a lot of translators. Uh, so obviously, I, if I don't have anyone on the database, I do know who to, to, to contact and who to reach out to. Um, and yeah, these people would still get on our books, even if they don't go through um, the official application form. So we do save the details of these people that we've been in touch with, um, through, like via email or, or this. Yeah. 
I suggest that we take some questions from our audience because we've got a lot of them. Yep. Good idea. Uh, the reader asked how to raise one's fees even if the agency pays low prices as a standard. Well, I would say number one, do not accept low rates. So if you consider an agency's a certain a certain agency's rate as being low, it doesn't work for that agency. Mm. It's simple as that. I mean, um, there are a lot of agencies uh, around, as there are a lot of translators around. Um, so, all if if a certain agency or client, it can be a direct client, um, uh, has rates you don't agree with, or any other terms you don't agree with, like payment terms, uh, you just you either negotiate. Or, or you just don't work for that agency. I mean, as I do have the, sometimes I do get inquiries um, from translators, uh, like the first time I work with them and saying, oh, how much do you pay? And I'm a bit puzzled every time. And I said, well, you are the freelancer, so mm. it's up to you to set your own rates. I may be able to work with you, with those rates or I may not um, may not afford you but that's a different story as a freelancer you should um, set rates that you are happy with and then find clients that are happy to pay those rates it's not the other way around you don't accept low rates from I don't know agencies and then try to um, to raise them so uh, the, you can raise rates with agencies but again you don't start with low rates you're not happy with it's that's not where it should start um the next question comes from tracy it's generally suggested that translation agencies expect you to have a specialization in one of the following fields medical finance business legal marketing but each of these fields is enormous how can you find out what sort of texts need translating the most within a specialization when you're starting out? Um, that's a good question. Um, I would say, with, well, with the specialization, I don't think you should start, oh, I want to specialize in this because um, I don't know why. It should be, it should come naturally, I would say, either because of your passion for a certain field or because your previous experience in a certain field or so first of all it should be something you know how to do properly mm -hmm. and something you're passionate about or you know you or a field that you know very well with with medical because you um one of the examples were was mm -hmm. or, or le let's say legal because i do some legal translations but not contracts for example i wouldn't touch contracts mm -hmm. i don't like them so I just don't do them simple as that so I think it's very important to also do um, to work on something you like mm. so that's yeah, I think that's that makes, how you that should work sense. towards yeah. specializing find something you like and you are good at yeah, absolutely I, I absolutely agree with you uh, what are some of some of the things that translators should pay attention if sh he or she wants to produce a good impression on an agency and what can ruin the first impression well first of all obviously number one is do a good job i think that should be um yeah that that's what makes a good impression <laughs> and makes the client love you and send you more work is obviously um do uh, very good work be responsive, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, make sure you're always up to date with uh, with your area of specialization, and with be up to date with the new spellings in your in your in your language. We had um, uh, I know that there are languages where these uh, rules change all the time, or where there are alternatives alternative spellings so you should always make sure you're up to date with the latest ones um, follow instructions from from the client um, what else um, uh, have the right skills as I said have the right attitude be easy to work with um, 
we've had, I, I mean, I've worked with translators who, despite being very good at what they do, so producing very good work, they were not the easiest people to work with. So I would be reluctant to work with them again, simply because they, they are difficult. Just, for example, I don't know, uh, refusing to uh, um, answer queries or, or considering a que one question sent the day after the project was delivered on, on the same day as being a nuisance and telling you straight to your face that it's a nuisance. So, yeah, that, yes, that happened. Um, so, obviously, that uh, that would be one thing. Mm. So, be, yeah, be, that's, that's... be very good at what you do. Uh, don't do sloppy work and be easy to work with. And always work on your skills. Uh, a comment from Dorita from the comment box. Um, uh, would a certification, the INO or ISO, count instead uh, as a master's in translation? Um, well, ISO refers to processes rather than translation skills. Um, and I think uh, the other one, uh, yeah, GIN, and as, one. as well. So it doesn't, they don't show um, someone's skills in that language uh, but yeah it, i would say it's more about processes processes rather than language skills so th this would be a bit different well but probably some certification from a translators association would could you place that is different. That is different. That is different. for example um in the uk uh, the deep trans diploma in translation from the chartered institute of linguists well, that is equivalent of a master's, uh, I think mm -hmm. it's level seven. Um, so yes, certification from uh, from a translators association is definitely good to have. Uh, Nicholas asks, what about junior translators? Do you give them a chance or do you prefer taking more experienced ones? It depends on what you understand by junior translators. Um, if, for example, someone who has just graduated from uh, a master's degree in translation, I wouldn't have um, a problem working with them. But if you mean um, uh, someone who said, well, starting now I want to be a translator. Um, <laughs> but I don't, I mean, I'm working towards a qualification but not yet fully qualified, no. So I would prefer someone with experience. But if so, someone who has um, um, who has graduated from, as I said, has a master's degree in translation, for example, or uh, that would be that would be enough. If they have um, a BA in translation, we would expect two years' experience. Mm. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, okay. thank you for, so much for asking, Nicholas. Uh, what can translators do to build a good and working relationship with the agency and as turn I, them into a lo loyal customers? As I said, rule number one, do a good work every time. I mean, yes, we all have, we might have our off days um, when we, I don't know, something might have happened. and um, But in general, obviously, you have to do a good job uh, deliver on time hmm. so that is it just uh, well it, it is part of um, doing a good job uh, not just uh, linguistically but also in terms of delivery uh, being responsive replying to um, queries after the project um, keeping in touch that is for example um, I think I had um, I worked recently with a translator who I hadn't worked in a while. I don't know if there was a particular reason, but just because she happened to get in touch uh, a couple of days before I had a project, mm. I just immediately thought of her when that project came. So keep in touch, keeping in touch with, um, like you said, it's about building relationships. So a more personal relationship uh, will will help because your name would be in that person's mind next time for the next project. Yeah, 
yeah, absolutely. I also try to spend as much time as possible and keep in mm. touch with my clients because I mean, it's, 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 it's obvious you, you want to be in touch with your clients and yeah. uh, especially in our line of work where everything is up and down feast and or famine. So yeah. you, you, you always have to be ready for those types of uh, yeah. slow, okay. slow times. So, so to speak, and you can prepare yourself by keeping in touch with all your clients. So they could, you could be always on their mind and you can always, just send a few nice, like, few nice words to them just for uh, even I if know, it's Christmas a holiday. Yeah, if it's, uh, holidays yeah. are a good time. Um, also, yeah. even if you just oh, um, I've just uh, completed this CPD in I don't know what area of yeah. specialization. Yeah, and just want to let you know, way. or uh, an updated CV, or just, or just to say hi. Mm -hmm. yeah. So have a this sort of relationship that, that helps yeah it's something that pops up a lot in our conversations with uh, <laughs> agency owners and colleagues that we just want to build that relationships and to build a relationship you have to keep in touch that's that's and that really obviously obvious. Yeah. yeah and that obviously works with um, direct clients not just mm -hmm. yeah. uh, not the, just mm -hmm. agencies so that is um, that can be applied to to direct clients as well. Yeah. I wonder, uh, have you have have you ever met your translators in person in real life? Yes, yes. Uh, I have actually become good friends with with um, with one of them. I don't, well, actually a few, but one of them that um, I also met in person. We are good friends as well, and we go out for coffee and stuff. So mm. yeah, I I have met um, a. Few, I don't know numbers or percentage, but I, I have met uh, quite a few of the translators I work with in person, be it events or um, when they came, I don't know, if they are, were not based in London, if they came to London, we went out for coffee or something. So yes, yeah, it's, it's actually very nice to, to meet people in person after you've known them online. And it's like, it's like you've already, you've known them for, quite some time and just meeting them in person it's really nice it was a really nice feeling <laughs> i can't remember now but there is an agency a uk-based agency i just can't remember the name they have a wonderful tradition of uh, setting up meetings for their translators so it's it's a kind of monthly event where oh, they nice. either either go out all together project managers and translators who are based somewhere uh, near that agency and they all go out together and then they post pictures online. I think it's such a great idea. That's it's, a, it's, yeah, it's, that's a, yeah, that's a mm. great, great idea. Yeah, speaking, uh, of, speaking of meeting your translators, what percentage of your translators live in the UK and abroad? Do you, oh. mean, do you prefer working with people in the UK or does it make any difference for you? Um, I don't know percentages to be honest, um, but I think most of the people I've worked with are based in the UK simply because it's easier to contact because they are local, uh, payments are easier as well mm -hmm. and with the Brexit for example we lost, um, we lost some money due to the exchange rate when the pound dropped because I mean mm -hmm. as I said we we mainly work with people based in the UK because I think most of the people who applied uh, to work with us are based in the UK, not because uh, it was something deliberate. But we do work with people outside the UK. Um, we, we try to find the most suitable people regardless of where, where they are based. Um, so as I said, we, with, uh, with the pound dropping, we had, um, we lost quite some, we lost some money uh, when we made payments um, in euros or, or dollars. Um, uh, but in general, I think, yeah, the mo most of the people we've worked with are based in the UK because it, these people happened, to, more people have happened to apply with us um, from the UK than from mm. other countries. Uh, but that wouldn't be the main criteria, no. So the main criteria mm. would be find the right person for that job. Hmm. Speaking about finding the, the right person, uh, how often do you proofread the work of your translators? Do they, are they systematically proofread? 
It will depend. Um, I mean, there are obviously we do have other QA in place, but um, if you if you mean uh, separate proofreading by a second translator, it will depend on the, on the project itself. Um, we do we always offer this option to the client, so we do offer them two options, whether they want one translator or two translators the second one doing the separate proofreading but there are clients who will have their own teams in those respective countries who would mm -hmm. rather do and would rather check the the text them, themselves yes we know uh, they would it's not the same thing as um as a translator or proofreader uh, but some clients would pre would prefer that they would have inside knowledge and sometimes they would probably just um change the 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 text based on um each uh, branch or, uh, on um specific inside knowledge let's say so they they would change it uh, they would deviate from the source um so it will depend on each project but imagine for example if you have a really small 30 words project i don't know uh, some a, a short email from a client to a potential business partner or to or we had um like a letter let's say i had i had to translate a love letter well it wasn't just one mm. I had some love letters to translate i mean come on i, I did offer, i did offer the client um the the option to have it proofread by a second person but obviously they they chose not to no first of all it was the cost and then this particular project did not really need a second um a second proofreader um but obviously i do inform them that if it's for publishing um it's best to have a separate proofreader not because we expect the translator to to deliver um, a work full of mistakes, but because obviously a, mm. an editor proofreader will pick up things that um, it's impossible to pick up when you when you translate yourself. So it will depend on on the project. Hmm. So uh, when when you have a big project, you would normally insist to to have a, a second proofreader or editor. I always insist on that. I mean, yes, if it's but some, um, and well, with the big projects, like for example, we had um, an urgent project uh, where we had to work with five or six linguists overnight, even to to deliver. Obviously, we had we ha we did have um, one of the one of the translators involved to do the, the final proofreading, final editing to make sure. Um, everything was consistent um, in the end, so that we do we ha we have to look at each project, analyze it properly, see who is, who it is for, um, and whether indeed a proof, a second proofreading, separate proofreading is required or recommended. And how do clients normally respond to that? Uh, do you have because uh, I mean. Direct clients, they, they don't quite understand the, the translation process. So I if see. I was a client, I would, if I was a client, I would say, how come uh, the, the translator cannot do the job properly in the first place? Why, why would I need <laughs> a second person, right? I don't think I've ever had this question, to be honest. Um, because I, I, <laughs> I do explain to them why this entails. And I do explain that um, proofreading, I mean, a second person doing the proofreading not necessarily it's not about necessarily spelling mistakes grammar mistakes because we don't expect those to we don't expect to have those in the first place but a second person might have um might see things like i don't know or this could be rephrased better or i mean it like typos can happen i mean typos that cannot be picked up by a, a spell check like form and from they would not be picked yeah. up by a yeah. spell checker, but a second person might might be might be able to to see them. So I do explain that it's not a matter of expecting the translation to be bad in the first place, but simply because it's human nature to make mistakes, um, and to and that a a second person might be able to pick up things that the first person couldn't. 
Yeah. But, but I, they the, I don't think they, they have a, a question. They, I mean, at least they didn't phrase it this way, like saying, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, But I think I tried to explain it uh, um, quite well from the from, from the beginning and explained, okay, this is what each option entails and why you should go for this or this one. Uh, a question from Tracy about CAD tools. Yeah. Uh, what do what do agencies agencies think about translators only learning cloud based CAD tools? Are Tradus and MemoQ a must? Like with everything, you know what oh, the translator's favorite answer for everything is: it depends on the context. Um, <laughs> so, so I would say it depends again. Um, with cloud based CAD tools, I think we should be a bit careful. Uh, and make sure the client is aware of the sort of CAT tool you are using because some sometimes you may be working with very sensitive material for which a cloud-based CAT tool may not be appropriate. Um, as for CAT tools being uh, compulsory, I would say CAT tools are really, really good. I can see, but it, again, it depends. Um, but CAT tools are good in terms uh, of um, productivity, they can increase your own productivity as a translator in terms of consistency, especially if you do um, this, if you work for the same client over a period of time, you want to be consistent if it's the same sort of materials as well. Um, but it will depend on the type of work you do. If you only work with, I don't know, hand written uh, medical notes, well, using a kettle wouldn't really help you much or if you do a lot of very creative work where you do a lot of brainstorming slogans and stuff i don't think a cat will, will help you although i do know um i've had i can't i can't remember who said um a literary translator said she uses a cat tool um to make sure she avoids repetitions or saying the same thing in the same way twice because mm. We, we, because it, she works with literary texts. Um, but as, as I said, it will depend. Um, and le, uh, I don't think, I mean, we don't actually insist on a particular cat tool. I mean, I, I don't really, um, for me, it's not important whether a person uses MemoQ or Trados or whatever. It's important that they're consistent um, in their work and I mean, the, it's best to learn one tool uh, and learn it properly so that you are more efficient rather than work with, I don't know, 10 different tools but not know any of them properly. Because uh, knowing one of them very well will increase your productivity um, and it will help you. Okay. What? Uh, Tracy. What is it? Okay. Uh, what if you still don't have one? Sophia asks. Uh, I presume if you don't have a cat tool. I think it's a good investment, but at the end, at the end of the day, I mean, it depends. Again, it depends on the sort of work you do. But yeah. um, I, I do think cat tools will increase your productivity and the quality of your work. That you can check, for example. Um, you can see you, you can make sure you you haven't left anything untranslated by mistake it can happen um, it, you can ensure you are consistent when it comes to terminology um, and if you have repetitive text that that will increase your productivity so, yeah, so there are some, uh, some recommendations from from the audience hmm. regarding the okay. cat the free cat tools Yes, yeah. smart cat, obviously, and you can check it out by clicking the green button under this video. Yeah, yeah and are, Omega, Omega, Omega T, is also I very think, good. is very good. Yeah, Omega <laughs> T is also good. Yeah, Omega, Omega uh, actually, uh, we actually also have uh, had uh, webinars both on smart cat and on Omega T. Oh, excellent, season. excellent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there are we'll free, there are free cat tools you know. around. Maybe you can start with those, obviously, until you. Um, you learn how to use them. I mean, the principles are similar, let's say, not the same, but similar. So start with one of those. And once you have pretty, um, 
you can afford investing in um, in I don't know, in Trados or or, or or a tool that works best for you. I think that's that's the main thing. Find a tool that works best for you. What about your agency personally? Do you guys have a kettle in place or we do, do you, have you use kettle? We do, we do, we do use. But as I said, when it comes to, uh, but we don't use them like for project management to allocate. Uh, to do this part is not um, automated through a cat tool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we still like the personal relationship we have with with the translators. Um, and as I said, cat tools are good, and um, we do. Ex I mean, it's good to have to for translators to use them. We, as I said, we don't impose one tool over another. So I think it's a translator should be, in general, should be free to choose uh, whatever catch tool they like and they're, they're most familiar with and they're most comfortable with. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Uh, the question is uh, that, that sometimes, sometimes uh, agencies, they impose those catch tools, especially agencies that are very, very big and they have uh, a lot of clients and they, 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 they got to figure out the, the the way to have a similar process for all their projects. That's why a lot of translators are having problems with that because if they want to work with a big agency, they have to play by their rules, so to speak. Again, um, you choose your. You have to choose your clients as well. So if you want to work with that client and these are their conditions, then yeah, yeah. yeah but there are agencies who do not impose. Tools yeah, there are, there are agencies who don't, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. like inbox. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the things that translators should never do when working with an agency? Uh, deliver late mm. or not deliver at all. Um, <laughs> Has it ever happened? No, no, we have no. no we have had <laughs> late deliveries, but. Uh, no, yeah, late deliveries. Yes, we 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 have had that uh, in the past. But it's best. I mean, it can happen. I'm not saying it can't happen. It can happen to anyone. But if if you know this is going to happen, or if you think it's going to happen, just get in touch with the agency and let them know. Uh, mm. So sometimes the deadline can be extended, and we will understand. We, I mean, if uh, if your child has gone to ah, oh, we had, for example, we had um, a case with an interpreter uh, who was supposed to attend an event at seven in the morning, um, so the second day, and during the night she was hospitalized. She had to have an operation on her vocal cords, I think it was even. Um, so obviously, that things happen, but she got in touch with us. She managed to get in touch with us, and we managed to find someone else uh, for that project. So, but if if she hadn't got in touch, imagine what would have happened. We in the morning when no one uh, would have attended the event. So always get in touch. Make sure you let them know if you expect such things to happen. Um, be prof as I said, be professional. Uh, not obviously in the work you do make sure you do a very good job and but in your overall attitude and um, even online behavior I mean um, I think I told this story um, at, at some of the uh, of the events I presented uh, at uh, with a certain translator who's very rude on social media um, and she already says bad things about agencies and PMs but not certain agencies or certain PMs or whatever, but she, like everyone, is, I, can, mm. I can't reproduce the word, no, I cannot say the words she uses. Uh, so yes, they were that bad. Um, and then, so she hates agencies, she hates PMs, everyone is bad, everyone is, and she uses certain words, and then she applied uh, to work with us. Hmm. So yeah, uh, you can imagine that her application was never approved because, I mean, yeah, I, I, she had all the right qualifications, and I mean, on paper, she has, she's uh, very, um, she's qualified, she's experienced, but as a person, it's not the type of person I would work with. So mm -hmm. be professional, keep a professional attitude and tone in in everything you do, including being online, because you never know who reads your tweets. Yeah, that's yeah, for sure. that's, that's that's a very good point.
We have an interesting question about rates from Beverly. She asks, not sure if this question was already asked, when applying for, uh, to an agency, how can we determine a price per word that is acceptable for a translation agency? How do we avoid being too low or coming in too high? Right. And um, about it a little bit. Yeah, it wasn't the same question. First yeah. of all, when setting your rates, um, you have to have a rate you are comfortable, you're happy with, not comfortable, you're happy with. And then take it from there. Um, some agencies might have, you may, you may be able to find what they charge their clients with some agency, you may be able to find that on, um, on their websites. So you, you can determine whether your rate would be too high. Um, with too low, I don't know, everyone might have a different, this is a bit subject, subjective in my opinion. I mean, mm. everyone might have, different people may have different um, ideas of what is a high rate or a low rate. So, but first of all, you, ha you must have a rate you are happy with and that you can live on, obviously. Um, and, and then take it from there. I think that's the main yeah. thing. Just have your rate uh, that you're happy with. It's also a very good tool online uh, published by uh, Luke Spare, I believe. Oh. Uh, Translation Rates Calculator. Uh, I think he made it available online for free. Uh, it was a, Earlier it was a part of his book, and now he offers it for free. Oh, so, Maybe you can uh, put uh, the link as yeah. well. Yeah, we, we can probably put a link to this tool in the description of, of yeah. uh, when we publish a, a recap on that would be the that is a that yeah. would be a good resource because uh, th th this resource is very valuable. Uh, Luke uh, has created a spreadsheet file with a lot of very complicated formulas where you can put in your uh, income targets. Uh, you, you can put in your expenses, your living expenses, and this will calculate your ideal rate that would be a good for your current living situation. Of course, you can either increase it if you want to or more money, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a very good tool, a translation race calculator by Luke Spare, but we, we're gonna share a link to this tool. You can also, when, very... if you are not sure about it, you can also ask colleagues. I mean, it shouldn't be a taboo subject, to be honest. I mean, you can ask um, and talk with colleagues in your language combination and maybe in the area where you live and see what, uh, a good rate is or what they charge so maybe you know where where i mean to use that as the starting point if you want yeah yeah absolutely that's a, a very good idea to ask around and ask people who are already work in, in especially if it's your language pair and even your field of expertise it's a good starting point to bet um, that is sometimes it's treated like a taboo subject but <laughs> Oh. But it's actually the subject that everyone wants to discuss, on the other hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's very difficult to discuss because every single person will have a, a different opinion about it. Exactly, and like that's Alina said, it's like Alina subjective. said, yeah, the, every, every single person has their own definition of low and high and, yeah. <laughs> and imposing this on other people, on the and other hand. It, it also it, depends on, it on the number of factors, on how much you want to work, in which country you live, uh, exactly. How high are the taxes that you pay? Because uh, speaking example, speaking of which, yeah. these 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 parameters are also included in this yeah, tool by the yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. It will also depend on your language combination. Yes, and on the language, on combination. language combination and on the field. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. translating an email is one thing. Translating a technical manual is a different thing. Do, yeah. uh, translating a slogan which can take a lot longer i mean if it's three words it might take you a lot longer than i don't know mm -hmm. uh, three pages of general um, email so there are a lot of factors that you need to take into consideration and i understand it's not easy when you're starting out but yeah speak to colleagues have a look online i think we are, we are lucky living um I mean, um, in the 21st century, when we have access to so many resources online, mm -hmm. and um, uh, so these things can—I mean, you can 
find find these this information quite easily. And, and like mm -hmm. like we discussed earlier, rates are subjective as well. Yeah. The next question from Tracy: What are common turnaround times? Oh, it. Uh, uh, it depends. <laughs> Again, it depends on the content. It depends on the project. Um, the answer, the answer to our questions. It, it depends. To me. <laughs> it, it depends. I mean, I always try to to set reasonable deadlines and turnarounds with the end client first of all, so that mm. I can do the same with um, the translators. Sometimes it's simply not feasible. Sometimes the client will need that project yesterday. Because yeah, yeah, you know, it happened. Um, so I would say, obviously, you, I I tell clients that um, as a rule of thumb, they should look at around one thousand five hundred words translated in a day, provided that person works on their project only, which is not always the case, as we we know. Obviously. Um, you can you can do more than that depending on the type of text you can do less again depending on the type of text so uh it it depends on the client's deadline if they have one if they don't have one and it's quite relaxed then obviously we can take it from there um but if they do have a really tight deadline a fixed deadline then we would ha we will have to we have to meet that deadline one way or another so as I said, we had a project, um, well, it wasn't the only one, but uh, let's say I had a project for Romanian, for example, where we had, I think about um, 14,000 words within 24 hours or so. Um, oh. And yeah, so it was a general text. Um, it wasn't anything complicated. Um, and I worked, uh, I, I had a team, I was part of the team with together with um, a couple of trusted colleagues and we ha we did that, we worked together as, as a team. So yeah, mm. it was urgent, uh, but that was, um, the deadline could not be extended in any way. So we had to, to do something and help the client find a solution for the client. I mean, we had requests like 80,000 words, like, uh, 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 at the end of the day and saying oh I want this tomorrow well I'm sorry I mean I can't mm. perform miracles so I do try to tell clients when something is not feasible at all but if it's even if it's difficult but still doable then I do try my best to to help them You shouldn't. Uh, okay. we have... Beverly says she's always a bit nervous when she's uh, when agency is asked <laughs> her rate. Well, you shouldn't be. You have your rate. They can. I mean, they can accept them or or not, depending on the type of agency. But if um, yeah, if your rates are not accepted by a certain agency, you're simply not a good match. So yeah. there are others around. I would say. And yeah. I've read it somewhere that it's actually a good sign that you are nervous when you have to tell a client your rate because that means that uh, you're probably, well, you shouldn't be too nervous because that might mean that you are charging too high for what you can produce. But if you are a little bit nervous, then it's okay because if the client accepts your rate uh, without any doubts, that probably means that you are charging too low. So. I think it was, I'm not sure whether it was Judy Jenner who said that um, mm -hmm. if all of uh, all your quotes are accepted, then you are definitely uh, charging too low. Mm -hmm. yeah, if absolutely. then, if only a really small percentage are accepted, then you might be charging a bit too high. So I'm yeah. not sure whether, I can't remember what a good proportion was, but probably 50-50, I would say. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm, so don't take my word for it. I think maybe we can, <laughs> uh, we can look online. But I think, yes, if, if all of your quotes are accepted without a blink, then you're probably charging yeah. too little. I mean, it's oh. the same whether you're working with our clients or agencies. In our case, it's the same. So, yeah. It just uh, thing is sometimes translators, they just get very discouraged when the uh, quote is uh, rejected, and they, they 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 immediately they start thinking that they're charging too high. 
And I feel it, like we, maybe, we, there, we, maybe there was one case, so yeah. you, you have to reach out to at least, I don't know. Yeah, you have to look at the clients. overall, yes, you have yeah. to look at several projects. And like with everything in life, you win some, you lose some. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I would like to thank all the people who are asking us questions. We, 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 we probably spending more time answering questions from our audience than we ever had on all our previous episodes combined. But I, so, I somehow, I somehow su suspected that it would be like this today. <laughs> yeah, so thank you and so I much, guys, for us. a great opportunity. Thank, thank yeah, you. For the people to ask the questions. Yeah. Yeah, because we, we, um, we, don't, we don't have that opportunity to have this a dialogue between freelancers and yeah, agency exactly. owners that, that often. So. Thank you so much, Alina, for agreeing to do this and no for providing the invitation. Yeah, it was really great. Very good questions as well. Uh, we have quite a few more. <laughs> Actually, four. Shall we? we it's up to you. I don't mind. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, it's almost Christmas, so we'll take all the questions. <laughs> uh, Daniela asks, "How much experience is required to work with an agency?" I think it it, um, it depends. If, again, I know you're going to hate this 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 answer by the end of it. Um, I think each agency will have uh, their own criteria. For example, in our case, um, as I said, if uh, for a translator with a bachelor degree in translation, we expect at least two years experience. If they have a master's degree, uh, and well, assuming some experience as well, that should be fine. Uh, if they have a degree in other field, not in translation, then at least five years experience in translation, I mean, even mm -hmm. if without a degree. Uh, but the, but then, or if they are qualified members of professional associations. Um, so again, we do look at each application or each uh, person we work with um, carefully, and we ha they have to match with with the requirements of the project as well. Mm. And Sophia asks, how uh, can we make an agency trust you and give you a chance when you are newly qualified uh, and don't have a lot of experience? Uh, well, if you have the right qualifications and the minimum of experience required and you've made a good impression on that person, I don't see a problem with um, getting your foot in the door. So. So, but again, it depends on the, the person you're approaching, depends on the agency, it depends on whether they, they have a suitable project for, for your language combination of, or for your specialization, especially when you're just starting out and you don't have a lot of experience, you, you don't have, um, you're not exactly specialized in, in the field the agency works with. So as I, I told you, it, it, it depends again, mm -hmm. it will depend. But yeah, I, I think making a good first impression and having the right qualifications, even if you don't have that much experience, should um, should help. Should I mean, we all have to start somewhere. So yeah, I know it, it's it's one of those vicious circles, isn't it? I mean, you don't have experience, nobody gives you a chance, therefore you can't get any experience. So it goes on and on and on. You can um, you can get experience by doing voluntary work. For example, mm -hmm. one, one way of getting experience is doing some voluntary work. Well, again, which projects to work on or to dedicate your free time and work for free is a different discussion, but find things, find projects that you're passionate about. I don't know whether you are passionate about the environment and want to work for an NGO or non-profit organization and help them with their translation needs and then use that as uh, for your portfolio. So that, that's one way of building up a portfolio when you don't have experience and you're just starting out. I hope that yeah. helps. I guess uh, the same answer applies. I mean, it depends, applies to another question about the question about certification, how important are certifications for agencies and whether it's a big plus if a translator is a certified translator, what would you say? 
Well, certif well, the UK doesn't have a certified, uh, doesn't have such a system. I mean, it's like in mm. Poland, Romania, you have sworn translators, certified translations, you have that in France as well. In the UK, you don't have such a system. So basically, anyone can certify a translation by um, accompanying the translation with a letter saying they are competent in that language combination and, and all that. Mm -hmm. um, however, but it's by certif certified translation, you understand someone who is a member of a professional association and have been, right. yeah, that, that, is a, that is a plus. I wouldn't say it's compulsory, but it's good to have. It will show, for me, what that shows is that you, you are committed to the profession. You're not doing it as a hobby. So that's mm -hmm. one thing. Another thing why this helps, so first of all, it gives um, it gives a good good impression, and as I said, it shows you are you are serious about your job, and also uh, most of these or, or these um, organizations associations have events, conferences, CPT uh, that will help you grow professionally. So it's it's a plus. I wouldn't say it's compulsory, but it's definitely a plus. Mm. And it probably opens new work opportunities. If you're certified, that means you, you can work with personal documents, birth certificates, yes. marriage yeah. certificates, yeah. death certificates. Absolutely, for, for this sort of, uh, of project, yes. Yeah. I, I want to ask uh, a question from a comment box, and it's a trick question, so be prepared, <laughs> uh, from Daniela. Mm. Uh, so you have a translator in your database whose rate is higher than other translators' rates in your base. Would you keep this translator as a first option when a job comes in, or would you keep them in case the cheaper ones are not able to take the job? I don't think price is the main criteria, or shouldn't be at least the main criteria. I mean, let's say we have um, English into uh, into Spanish. Um, uh, yeah, uh, English. Let's say English into Spanish, right? Uh, we do have quite a lot of translators for this language combination, but each one of them is different. I mean. They, they don't all specialize in um, in medical translation. If we need a medical translation, obviously not all of them will be uh, suitable for that project. Or So first of all, um, we look at how suitable that person is for the job. And it's quite rare to have two people with the exact same qualifications that would be suitable. So um, as long as obviously, uh the the rates are within uh what you normally expect or what we i mean similar let's say to other translators it should never be it shouldn't be about going for the cheapest there will you will always have there will always be clients direct clients or agency that will go for the cheapest option and that happens everywhere so we we have clients who, who said they didn't go with us. They chose another agency simply because of the price, because they chose mm -hmm. the cheapest option. It's up to them. So the same with agencies, but it shouldn't be. I I do agree with that 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 price shouldn't be the main criteria when allocating a project. So first of all, you need to find the most suitable person. But yeah, yeah. there will be. I mean, do expect client. Do ex you will you will come across clients for whom uh, price will be the main criteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the the thing is that uh, a lot of times when you hire a translator who is cheaper, so to speak, uh, you you'll get what you pay for. We did have actually we did have um, a situation with a client who. Um, had everything translated with another agency. Well, he, he did tell me in the end with whom and uh, how much he paid. And um, so he came to us with the project saying, oh, we've already have this translated, but we need to redo them. And I said, well, how come? And um, he said, because, well, he did pay very, very little, but the quality was very, very poor. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, in the end, he understood that quality comes at a price, um, and yeah, we did work with them in the end, and the, everything were, was was fine. Um, yeah, even if we were, I think he said, I think it was six times we were six times more expensive than the the first agency. <laughs> no. What? But, yeah. What do they pay their translators? That's exactly a, a very but good question. I think, but most clients, I think. They just thank them for their work. 
<laughs> I think most, but most clients, um, I mean, when I, and I mean direct clients with, don't know what to expect. Just like when I yeah, need, sure. I don't know, um, if I need a solicitor, um, I mean, I know what solicitors charge in general, uh, but if I need a solicitor, I wouldn't necessarily know exactly what their work entails. So sometimes, I mean, it, this happens with, with everyone, when you, when you buy a service that you don't know um, anything about, yeah. then one of the criteria you'll be looking at is, is price mm. and how they come across. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And how they come across and yeah. And in case yeah. of translation, you can, uh, you cannot really uh, evaluate the result as such. You can, you, you yeah. can, yeah. In in many cases, you yeah. you probably will understand that the result is bad when you don't have I don't know conversions on your website. I don't want to give examples With, from, for example, the field of medical translation because there the results can be disastrous. Yeah, the results of bad translation. Absolutely. Uh, with yes, this client, it was easy because they had the, um, the the project was about an app, so they had a lot of complaints mm -hmm. from the end users when they started mm -hmm. using the app in those languages. They were like, no, this is doesn't sound right. This is I, this is yeah, yeah, not good. So yeah, yeah, but sometimes yeah, mo clients will not be able to evaluate um, the quality of 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 work. True. Mm. Yeah. And our last question comes from Julia. She asks, I would like to specialize in medical translations, but I have no experience, only some personal background. What would you recommend for someone like me? How do I go about getting hired by an agency in this particular field? Do I get some education first, which is expensive, or try to find work first and get my certification diploma as I go along? I have a bachelor's degree in linguistics and a master's in a different field. Right. Uh, what do you mean? Well, it depends what it depends. Uh, it depends on what you mean by personal experience. So, if you have, if for example, you've you've worked in the medical field, then that's definitely a plus. Um, but I would suggest um, maybe CPG and work. Um, you you can work with um, a more qualified translator, someone who's got a lot of experience in medical translations. At least work with have them revise your work so um again yeah if you do have if you have met if you have a medical background you've worked as um i don't know as a doctor or or as a nurse so obviously you you do have this sort of knowledge that's definitely a plus so it's it's very good um then i would suggest you're right, if you want to go for a master's degree, that might be uh, in translation, that might be expensive, might not be an option for you due uh, to cost or time or whatever, but you can do uh, a CPG. And as I said, you can work with uh, someone who already works in the field and ask them to, to, to yeah, you, you can work as a team and collaborate. Um, and then maybe they can recommend you further, so. Mm. So if someone wants to get hired by an agency, they should probably look for a colleague who could give them recommendations, right? I, it might be a good way. Yeah, but they should, if you have, a, as I said earlier, if you have, a, I mean, as an agency at least, if you have mm -hmm. um, a degree in a different field, not in translation, then we would expect at least five years experience in translations. Mm -hmm. So, as far as I understand, uh, Julia has experience in translation. She's just ah. she just wants to uh, add another field of expertise to her portfolio. Well, then in this case, well, it depends. As she said, she's got some personal experience in the field of medicine. So it depends on mm -hmm. what that personal experience entails. So if she, if um, Julia, so if you've worked as I don't know, if you've worked in. Uh, in in the medical field, and you also have a degree in translation, that should, should be fine. That shouldn't be a problem. Um, mm. So you can combine those. You can combine those very well. Um, but if you don't, let's say if you don't have enough experience, you can you can do some um, CPD. There are a lot of courses around uh, that you don't have to go for like really expensive expensive ones. You can get you can try and get certified. Um, 
by the, I don't know, ITI, CIOL, or a professional association where that entails an exam. I mean, the fees are probably a lot lower than a, if, you, if you were to do a, a master's. I think that if a person has experiences working uh, in working as a translator and just wants to uh, add another specialization, uh, then it's probably more important to to learn the subject matter. So yes, in this absolutely. Case, some medical. Um, there are, I think I, I just I think if uh, today I think uh, I don't remember. I think I saw a tweet, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think it was might have been Janie Fox. I'm not sure um, who tweeted about uh, some um, medical. No, some books for medical translators. So people who want to specialize or who are specialized in medical translations, there are some very good resources. Um, if you follow Janie Fox on, on Twitter, she's a medical translator. Um, mm. So she, I'm sure she has, uh, she ha I mean, she also has a website and a blog, if I'm not mistaken. So you might have, might find some resources there as well that will help you, uh, that will help you. Yeah. Okay, so Another confirmed thing. she's a Jamie Fox who tweeted that. Good. So yeah. Another thing that comes to that does just come to my mind is uh, there are courses on Coursera, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. there is also a translation community there. And I know that there are people who translate courses in the areas of specialization where they do know some certain things. I have uh, a friend who translated some courses about programming and she's actually a programmer. So I suppose there might be some uh, medical translators or probably even doctors who also translate medical courses. So you could do something good for the community while also honing your medical translation skills. Yeah, I think that's, that's it's also idea. a good great, option. Yeah, great one. And also, while earning that, uh, yeah, probably not qualification, but experience. The experience, um, yeah. That you can show. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You can build up, you're building up your portfolio, yes, absolutely. So, if we don't have any, we don't have any questions left, I want to thank everyone who asked so many great questions. And I want to thank Alina for coming to our show. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. And it thanks was... for it. Thank, thank you to everyone attending. We had um, a lot of people and thank you for all the questions. Excellent. I think it was a great talk because the, there are not the, there are not so many opportunities. Well, you present a lot at translation conferences, but not everyone goes to translation conferences. And for people sure. who don't go there, I think it was a great opportunity to um, get some answers that they were looking for from 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 actually an, a potential employer. And I think <laughs> it's yeah, it's really great. I hope. Everyone enjoyed that? I did. Our conversation? Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> did you want to add anything, Dimitri? Uh, yeah, uh, this is actually going to be our last episode this year. Yeah. Uh, I hope you guys have uh, a very Merry Christmas. Uh, happy holidays. Thank you so much for watching this second season. The season is not over, so don't freak out. <laughs> we'll be back in... <laughs> We'll be back in January, uh, yeah. around 17th of January. Uh, it's going to be on January the 18th. Yeah. We already uh, we, have some interviews scheduled, so. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, a few guests lined up. But meanwhile, if you want to give us a good Christmas present, uh, you guys can share this uh, webinar online. Oh, uh, you, can also, oh. you can also... Oh. You can also visit our website at translatorsonair.com if you're not subscribed to our mailing list and subscribe so you will never miss future episodes. And if you have any ideas for guests or if you want to be a guest just like Alina, uh, you can also visit our website and go to translatorsonair.com slash guest and just fill out the form there. And mm -hmm. thank you so much for watching and uh, I guess we'll see you guys next year. Yeah. Thank you and um, happy holidays, everyone. Merry Christmas and um, Merry Christmas a wonderful 2017. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> happy New Year. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.